What's going on guys? Got a guest appearance here on Stand Up Sales. Um, normally I'm with David Jacob, but I got a, another David here filling in for him. Um, really excited to get you on the pod, bro. Absolutely love the content. I know we've spoken once on, on your channel, um, but uh, tell the viewers what you're all about. What's your background? Yeah, my name's David, ex Loan Shark. I used to use that as my, my Twitter, hand, or my Twitter uh, bio, but uh, I was an ex loan shark from the time I was 22 to 24. Did $39.7 million in outbound revenue generation on the phone. And it kind of pissed me off because if I stayed another week or two, it would have been 40. But that being said, probably done, you know, over well over 100,000 cold calls. Did close to 1,000 deals. Started a marketing agency. Did all right with that. Shut that down. Now I run a company called Cashflow Syndicate which is a sales and marketing education platform that pretty much gives you the entire skill set that you need from you know, starting a business, outbound, outbound sales, offer creation, how to do the copywriting, how to do the service delivery, how to go and get clients, how to do everything under the sun when it comes to that. Uh, but Dylan, it's glad to be here. Or I'm glad to be here. Likewise. Sorry, dude. man. Long day. No, you're good. I know there's a time difference. You're over there in Dubai. Um, what time is it there? It is seven, about to be 7 p.m. So About to be 7 o'clock. Yeah, it's, it's been a long week. It's going to be 11 a.m. here. So big time difference there. But, uh, but no, so loan sharking. Like, like I have no idea what was entailed on that. I'm assuming people took out loans and defaulted and you're the person that had to cold call them and have a tough no, conversation. So, I, so, yeah, so I was, glorified, I was a glorified loan officer. I, I called myself an ex-loan shark. I called, you know, glorified loan shark because I, I thought it was pretty funny. But pretty much my, my role, so, it was a, so I worked for a financial technology company and a component of what the company actually did was they had an arm of the company where we offered uh, short-term capital business loans. Got it. And so within those, so the structure of these, these loans were we can get the funds, you know, depending if the documents are correct and everything submitted, we can get the funds you know, either at 12 p.m. the same day or 4 p.m. the same day or the next day, right? So pretty much tw within 24 hours, we could get that money out. And so these were short-term capital loans. They weren't, you know, multi-year. They weren't even monthly payments. They were weekly payments, and they were, you know, on the interest side. It was, you know, simple interest, which is you take, let's say, you take a hundred grand, you pay back fifteen, right? Okay. And so pretty much the entire job was we got a, a, a list of leads, uh, we got an account book, three hundred leads, about two two fifty to three hundred leads a month, and then it was like, hey, like, just get everything you possibly can across the board. So straight up outbound cold calling and, and I worked in the department that we would call upon previous customers or current customers and then offer them an upsell. So my department was the bulk of the revenue generation for the company because the easiest person to sell something to is somebody that's already bought from you before. Right? Okay. So we would be calling, essentially we'd be calling upon, you know, let's say Dylan, you took 50 grand for your company. And so I'd call you up and I'd have a special discount for you, a magical offer for you. And yeah. then I would try to get you to take an extra 50 grand. And what the, essentially the deal was, was whatever you had left on the loan, let's say you paid down 30 of it, yeah. we'll roll that, you don't even have to pay us that 20, we'll just roll that over into the next 50 and we'll send you 30. But you're paying back the same amount as 50, right? So it, it, was, a, it, was, it, was, it was a finesse, but um, yeah. it was a finesse, but you know, average deal size is about 40 grand um, and yeah, and, and so I learned so much about sales and, and so much about my own life and myself and, and kind of the work that's required. And like, so like essentially my day would be like, you know, you get on eight, four, you, you get in into the office and it was like, you know, very open space, kind of boiler room environment. Everyone's got your headset on. Yeah. And essentially you just sit there and you call people all day. Yeah. And you have to sell as much as possible. It's like you sell as much as possible. Like I remember, you know, my, my old sales manager was my, was my mentor and he taught me everything I know about how to close and just how to facilitate, you know, different, you know, really dig and really get the information out of, out of the, the lead or, or the person that you're talking to. And then also just kind of hit them over the head until they close. But like uh, he used to say to me, he's like, yeah, I don't care how much you did yesterday. I don't care. Close 15 deals yesterday. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. And every day. And, and every day starts at zero. So from like a management perspective, like as a young kid, it's like it, it, I kind of adopted that mindset. Like I was 20, I just turned 22 years old. And for me, like a kid from South Philly, 
with the where nobody pretty much barely ever touches six figures a year to, to have an opportunity at 22 to go in and, and start making money was like real money, like a hundred get hundred grand at least out the gate, like, you know, 10, 13, $15,000 a month in commission checks was, it was absolutely valuable to me. And it allowed me to, to really develop the skills and really get successful really fast. And I think, you know, the biggest thing that people struggle with is the lack of repetition because you really need to understand that the volume game makes you good. But yes. yeah, it's just crazy, crazy environment. It was, it was a crazy, crazy time. 11 hours a day of pitching, 11 hours a day of talk time some days, 150 calls. Like, you know, you're opening up 10, 15 deals, trying to get everything across the board. Like you're managing shit. 20, like imagine everything is on fire and you have to just stay composed. It's like, yep. you know, theoretically the job's easy. It's just call these people and sell these deals. But it's like, no, you got these, this deal with these documents. You got to call this guy back because he did, it's a big mess. But it was a lot yeah. of fun. Absolutely. So that was your first like indoctrination into sales? Second. Environment? Second. Second. So, yeah. yeah, so I'd done a little stint in like the insurance kind of cold calling financial advisory thing where you're pretty much an SDR for, uh, where you're setting appointments for the guys who work at like the insurance firm. And that was completely unpaid. I think it was an unpaid thing with like unpaid, it was like, you know, everyone sells every sales job as uncapped commission. But yeah, it was interesting <laughs> because like they wanted you to get licensed and about two weeks in, I already knew that like I wasn't going to go down this route. So I never ended up getting the license. So I just kind of like worked there and kind of toyed with the idea. I didn't make that full commitment, especially because it was just straight commission and I would just be in the office all day, kind of just chilling on my computer and like just, I, I didn't take it that seriously. But when I got into the other role, the year, yeah. the year after, when I got into that role, I took it 100% seriously because I had finished, I had finished school and I was like, I remember my friend, he showed me a pay, he showed me a pay stub for 12 grand and he was a month younger than me and we were the same age and he, we just graduated together and I looked at it and I said, what the fuck? Yeah. What am I doing? What do I, I, I need to be doing to get that? Where, and I was like, where do I sign? <laughs> so like literally like Wolf of Wall Street, like I'll quit yeah. my job. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy dude. Yeah. I mean like yeah. I started out, you know, in sales, I did door to door, right? I sold copiers, which. If anyone's watching this, don't do that. It's a terrible, terrible gig because they're, they work off six to eight year contracts. So like the amount of total addressable market is massive, but the amount yeah. of total addressable market that's actually in a contract year is like so hard to find, especially door knocking. So that was like my indoctrination of sales. I was like, yo, this is tough, dude. I was in college. I employed two of my fraternity brothers and we would go knock doors like two days, two, two three days a week. And like, yeah. <sighs> half hung over, like no solicitation <laughs> signs, people getting pissed off of you. And like, that was way before we had all this cool technology that all these kids have nowadays where like they have like yeah. automated emails and like chat GPT to do your shit and like all this stuff. Yeah. Like, it was pounding pavements, actual physical business cards going back into the office, typing yeah. the actual number in on a, on a corded phone and trying to set meetings and like, if, it was super invaluable. Like looking back at it, like I'm so glad I did it. But in the moment, you're like, "This is fucking terrible." Yeah, it's but it's like, like pledging, right? It's like yeah. it's the best. It's the best thing you never want to do again. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, I'll never go back to that. Um, and then I, the second gig, I got into SaaS tech sales, and I was in a boiler room. It was like 26 SDRs in a room that's a little bit bigger than the one I'm in right now, and everyone's just pounding the phones, pounding the phones. You can hear everyone talk, and it's like. When I first started there, because I was used to like, like in-person sales, right? Yeah. I did door knocking and car sales before that, and like going from being able to have a smile, a firm handshake, dress nice, to establish credibility, like you had to. Yeah. The only thing you could rely on was your voice and your tonality and your yeah. confidence on the phones. That was like a hard thing for me to like learn, as yeah. well as like fucking up in front of your manager and fucking up in front of your you know colleagues on yeah. the phone like what if you mess up an objection or someone hung up on you or whatever happened like overcoming that super invaluable like for personal reasons and like yeah. you touched on that a little bit like you grew so much not only career wise but as like an actual human being yeah for being in that type of environment yeah like even i didn't feel like i was good at sales until i left like yeah. until i quit my job i didn't feel like i was good at sales <laughs> and a lot of the like you can have, and you've seen, you've probably seen this in your management, it, it just as a manager, right? Like you can have two guys who are the exactly, exactly the same in style, but one is just more confident. 
One's yeah. just going to work a little bit harder, and he's always going to win a lot more, right? Okay. So for me, what I learned is like, for, like coming into it, and this is something I was saying, I actually saw on Twitter the other day. When you just get started and you're brand new and you're green and you're a, you're a newbie, like you are like a deer in the headlights. And yeah. once you start to see some success, the mistake a lot of people make is they're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm brand new. Like they'll be six months in, they'll have like a million dollars under the belt and they'll be like, oh, well, I'm new still. I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't know. And one of the biggest confidence shifters for me was when I really started to see the success, my, I remember my mentor is like, nah, like he's like, yo, you, like, he's like, David, you're not a new rep anymore. Like talk your shit, bro. Like you, yeah. you know what you're Own doing. It. Own it. Like you know what you're doing, bro. And then I was like, oh, I guess I do know what I'm doing. And then when you start to really, when you start to like start crushing, when you start crushing it, right, then you have all the people who were like, good, they're asking you like, yo, like, what are you doing? Yeah. And that's like really important. And you have to have that confidence shift because sometimes some months don't go well, right? Like some days don't go well, some weeks don't go well. And you'll be like, ah, oh, am I actually as good as I think I am? Am I actually as good as I think I am? But I think one of the biggest things is like when you really start to, when you know that like you can pick up a phone and you can generate, you can just make money appear out of thin air. I think everything is, uh, everything is okay in life. And so- yeah, you brought up a good point there. It's like, like self, belief like that's massive in sales like yeah that comes across subconsciously to the other person on that side of the phone is like your total confidence in your abilities as well as the product that you're selling that yeah. is going to go further than like sales talent quote unquote yeah. is like your actual conviction in your voice and what you say like people pick up on that instantaneously like especially yeah. with cold calling right like with cold email your fourth or fifth email can be really good and they're gonna get it no matter what. But if you are not confident in the first five to 15 seconds of that cold call, when they pick yeah. up that phone, they're like, fuck, this is a cold call. And you can't overcome that immediate defense mechanism on the other side through your voice, like you'll never ever be able to succeed in phone sales. Yeah, I, I agree. I think what it gave me is it, it, it gives you the confidence to be yourself. Right. Yeah. And that's an interesting idea, but it also gives you the confidence because when you're selling to, especially when you're selling, to, so I, I did B2B, right. And you, you also did B2B. So when you call somebody or you call it a founder that, and they're doing the biggest guy I ever did a deal with, he ran pro payment processing, HR, he ran an HR company, but that handled the payment processing for people in air, people who work jobs in airports. Okay. He was doing 300 million a year. Not bad. And so, to get on the phone and be able to like talk to that guy and have a, and as like a 22, 23 year old kid, like I still felt like a kid, even though I was a grown man, right? Like you still, like you st I feel like before you're 30, 31, you're, you're a little kid, but even, even now. And I think being able to have conversations like that with like people who are doing a million a month, 20 million a month, 33 million a month, five million a month, like different levels or even 20 grand, 50 grand, a hundred grand, right? Or like you'd call a kid who's like 24, 26 or something he's doing like, and you see, and you see the statements, he's doing a hundred grand a month. And you're like, and I'm sitting there at 22. I'm like, this guy's just a little bit older than me. Like, what is he doing? And being able to have those conversations and also create and create and make an offer that makes sense based on their industry, based on their situation. It gave me a lot of experience in so many different industries. Like I can tell you all about the construction industry. I can tell you about Amazon. I can tell you about guys that ship containers across the world and import export businesses. I can talk about payment processing. I can tell you about the guys who, who do a million and a half dollars a month selling fences. Like yeah, you start to learn all these different right. businesses, but also you start to see the problems. You start to see the gaps in the market and the entire way that you sell money, essentially you're selling money is you help that you help bridge the gap from where they are now to where they want to be that's sales and it teaches like it, it was just very eye-opening for me in terms of wow there's a lot of people making a lot of money out there and then also gave, having confidence to tell tell the guy that's doing two million dollars a month in real estate that he needs this hundred and twenty grand because you see on his bank statements how much he's actually got left over Right. And you, and you're actually sitting there telling this guy that, Hey man, I mean like you need this because you may run into a cash flow problem or, you know, what if this doesn't work out? Like you're saying, 
or use this as an insurance policy and just keep it in the checking account, just an insurance policy for the success of your future business. Like shit like yeah. that, right? And so, it, you know, it teaches you a lot and it teaches you, it teaches you the confidence in, and specifically on the cold call, right? How do you even open up a, a conversation? Like the reason why like I accredit the speed of which I was able to do things in, in business after I left that opportunity was because I already had the experience from the opportunity. You just, you yeah. know what to say. It's just a different, it's just a little bit of a different pitch. It's the same, same fucking thing. You don't got to treat them any differently. Yeah. Like there's, at the end of the day, they're still a human. They still wake up the same. They still, you know, have the shit after they drink a coffee, right? Like yeah. they're the same person, right? They just make more money than the normal person. So yeah. like not like putting people up on a pedestal and then giving yourself like psyched out or like creating anxiety. Like, oh my God, this guy is like, he's doing $300 million a year. I've never talked to somebody who's like, like it's still a person. Right, they still yeah. have the same emotional triggers. They still have the same way they think about business. Maybe a little bit different, but like going into it of like I've done this a million times is what is going to build that confidence. Yeah. And they're going to be like, because they're going to expect you to talk to them in a different way. And when you don't, yeah. that breeds that confidence. Like okay, like this guy's done this before. And yeah. like not putting like, them on a pedestal. Even just that's like, why it comes down to reps. Yeah. Like, cause you exactly. make so like, many like, just to everyone. Little language patterns. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had a rep. Like, the there's like little language patterns and stuff, right? Yeah, like inflection. Can, can you hear me? Am I, am I lagging at all, Dylan? No, I think you're all right. Am, am I lagging? Oh, okay. No. Am I lagging? Um, okay. No, no, no. I was just, it, it was, uh, what's it called? It's all good. Um, okay. yeah, yeah, like little, little, thing, little things like that like can, can make a break or a sale and like, What's funny is, is like in, in the space right now, you have all these people saying like, oh, this is a high ticket offer. Like, no, nah, but you don't know a high ticket, uh, what a high ticket offer is until you've sold a half a million dollar deal on the phone with a guy doing 300 million. Like a, a $4,000, $5,000 offer is not a high ticket offer, right? No. And so when you start out, like, especially to all, like all the guys that are going to listen to this, who like want to become entrepreneurs, it's like, if you have prior sales experience where you're handling, you know, large ticket deal sizes, right? Where you're used to pitching numbers where it's like the payment on this loan is seven grand a week or it's $15,000 a month or something like that, right? Or two grand a week. You know that people can afford that two grand a week or they wouldn't take the deal. The thing is, is when you're on the phone and you got your agency service and you say, oh, well, it's, it's $1,500 a month. Can you afford that? I'm not just, like, it's like, bro, it's like, so, so for me, like when I started out, it's like you get on the phone with the business owner and you pitch a four, yeah, the price is four grand. Like, and then, and then they say, oh, well, that's a little high. We can't afford it. What do you mean you can't afford it? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, you gotta, you gotta navigate them seeing the ROI, right? Like that's yeah. like solution-based selling and a lot of people don't sell that way, right? It's you like, have to creating to. a business case yes. for your product or your service. Yep. So like it comes down to knowing the person's business and knowledge of that industry. Cause you could talk to somebody who does, you know, shipping containers or does, you know, payment processing for HR now, and you can come in as an expert. And I was talking about this on our last pod, um, like having like establishing credibility by understanding and speaking their terms yes. of their industry. Yes. It's like, oh, this guy fucking knows payment processing, right? And like, yeah. you're like, so you're probably making this percentage on this, and then this yep. is probably some of the reasons that you're you know losing money or whatever the hell it is. And like coming in with that like knowledge and industry experience and the confidence to deliver that to somebody who Absolutely. knows more than you in that industry is going to create in the mind of the buyer that you're on a level playing field, not that you're just a salesperson that's trying to close a deal and make a commission check, but you're actually someone who understands their problems and their needs and you can relate to them on their playing field. I agree 100,000%. Yeah. Your job as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as the person who is going to be directly responsible for the revenue generation is yeah. to create leverage out of thin air. And the only way that you can create leverage out of thin air is by seeking to understand the person that you're pitching to. One of the biggest mistakes that new salespeople make is this. They'll sit on the call and say, hi, Dylan, where are you calling from? Um, I'm, you know, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'd really love to work with you guys. And all they're thinking about in their head is what do I need to say to get this guy to close? Yep. Right? How do I get money? 
the way you may, so so there's a there's an old book, very old book. It's called the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it says the life you seek you will never find. Now that principle is 100% true. You have to seek to understand. If I don't understand anything about your business, if I don't understand if I can actually help you, or create something that genuinely makes sense, yeah. it's not going to work. You have a tough time. You have a tough time. It's 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 not it's not going to work, right? So like, if more salespeople on the call genuinely sat there and understood their pros their sp their prospect, right? Like I always take the first fifty. If usually you can lock up deals like pretty fast. Like if, if you're used to it, like if you're used to like volume sales, you can lock up deals. Like I don't know why people take an hour for a fucking sales call, but you can lock up deals. Like I, I always spend the first five minutes like, Hey, like, you know, look like what I like to do is, is X, Y, Z. Um, so I, I just have a couple questions for you. I need, I need to start, I need to understand kind of where you're at, right? Bam questions. And then all those questions, you just the first level, second level, tertiary level questions. And then the fourth, fifth, sixth, like you have to go really deep. And then use that information because as we know, as salespeople, prospects lie, use that information. And then the next thing that you do, instead of giving them like a demo about your product, like they don't really care about the product. Like as a business owner, all we care about is how does it make money? So framing your service as, okay, cool. All of these answers, all these questions and all of their answers, we're going to now build into our ROI presentation of how does it make money? Right. I, and, and you can say that, you know, I can, I can either walk you through a demo or I can show you how it makes money or I can do both. Right. What, what would you prefer? And so then you just use whatever they said and you build in the ROI, right? Like you're essentially most service based businesses, you are selling money at a discount. And so you have to show them the ROI. You have to promise, okay, I'll give you five grand today, for 50 grand tomorrow. And so that is essentially, that's what the, that's what a business is. The issue is, is everyone just says, oh, well, I need to handle this objection and this no, like the reason they have objections is because you're not doing a good job. You're not doing a good job of understanding that, right? Yeah. If they have, and, and there's only really two objections, either they don't think it's going to work or they genuinely can't afford it. And the second one's bullshit because if they, it, because if they really think it's going to work, they're going to slap it on a credit card. Yeah, hundred percent. And like the way that I look at it from an analogy perspective and you use it perfectly is like the tertiary questions matter yep. the most, right? Like it's the difference between a paper cut and a stab wound. Right. Mm -hmm. Which ones are you going to the emergency room for? When you ask that first yeah. question, you open up a paper cut. It's yeah. a little bit of pain, but they're fine. You got to ask those deeper questions that open that wound up until it's a it's a, a screaming need for them to get a solution for. And the only way you do that is by intelligently listening to the information that you're receiving, formulating an extra question that digs deeper into that pain and asking why and yeah. understanding the true emotional trigger to a business problem. Because as an entrepreneur, your business is you at yeah. the end of the day. And like understanding the people you talk to care more about the business than probably themselves, right? That's why a lot of entrepreneurs are out of shape or high stress or addicted to things. And like they truly genuinely care about their business like above almost everything else in their world. And like understanding the things that keep them up at night, the things they're talking to with their leadership team every single week that they're looking and trying to find a solution for. If yeah. you're able to I, identify and uncover that emotional trigger, you're gonna close an exorbitant amount of deals with not even having to pitch too much. Yeah. You're just understanding and diagnosing that person. Once you get a good diagnosis, then you're able to prescribe something. Like think about you go to a doctor's office, you're like, my knee hurts. He's not gonna be like, all right, let's get you prepped for surgery. Like he's gonna have to understand what the hell's going wrong inside of your knee, right? Maybe it's a, a, a ligament problem around the knee, right? Like yeah. you have to diagnose and understand before you can prescribe. And people prescribe way too early on, like you said, and they sell with optimism, not pessimism. And like, oh, I'm super excited to work with you. Like you guys are a great fit. Like we're gonna crush it for you. Like why, how? Th that's what you say on, yeah, like that's what you say on the back end of the call. Yeah. Right? Like that's like, so like one of the things I say to like all like the new people starting out in business who like don't have any clients and don't have any results, right? You got to sell you, right? Like you got to sell like, I will do whatever it takes in order to get this done. Like whatever I need to do, I don't care if I got to work 30 hours a day, I will get this done for you. Right. But that's what you say towards the back end after you've already made an offer that makes sense. Right. That's like the little extra cherry on top. That's like the little push, you know, when, when they're about to jump off the, you know, jump into the, you know, just dive into the water, like that's the, the little push, right? Or that's the rock they trip over. The thing is, is when, especially in like the, the agency space, right? It's so fucking important. 
to have different types of offers for different client prof profiles, right? Great point. You're not gonna sell somebody marketing or SMMA or ads who doesn't even have their top of funnel correct. Yeah. If they don't have, like, you need different things. You need to be able, you, and you need to be, re really, you need to be an expert. You need to have different things that you can offer to the di different types of people that you're going to service, the different types of customers that you're going to service. Because if you don't, you are not only leaving money on the table, I know everyone loves that fucking expression, but you're not only leaving money on the table, you genuinely, like, you're not doing the best possible job that you can, right? Your reputation is, obviously, it's everything. And, like, this is, this is what's important. Like, a lot of guys, you know, and I'm kind of responsible for this, <laughs> but a lot of guys will go into like e-commerce email marketing. It's like the staples easy button. It's like the, I'm going to, I found this thing on the internet. I'm going to go into e-commerce email marketing. I'm going to become a copywriter. I'm going to make email. I'm going to write emails that make money. Right. Yeah. The thing is, is like AI is just going to crush you. Like I can load up chat GPT and say, write me a direct response email selling this, this thing, this product for this thing, or write me a story about two fat, like, in the style of David Ogilvy, in the style of, of, of whoever, whatever copywriter, right? Yeah. Or Gary Halbert, and it's gonna perform better than whatever the, whatever the fuck they wrote. And so, you have to go in and you have to really understand and become an expert in your market, right? If you're gonna handle e-commerce brands, what type of e-commerce brand are you gonna handle? Or do they sell clothes? Do they sell energy drinks? Do they sell lighters? Do they sell like smoking supplies? Do they sell you know fashion accessories, right? And then you have to go really deep, so like, what makes other companies successful and understanding what makes other companies successful, right? And then so when you, when you, when you speak to a brand or you speak to a, a founder and they're doing, like they're running the Walmart model versus the Rolex model, right? And their product is priced at Rolex but they're doing Walmart style shit, you have to tell them. And so most guys, and like I said, most salespeople, they'll sit there, what do I need to say to get this guy to close? But at the end of the day, you have to sit there and say, look, you're, you're messing up and here's how we're going to fix this, right? Just from what I've seen now, this, 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 and this, right? And so like, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And that's a good, that's like a good thing that people need to understand is that you're never, ever done selling. You don't learn, like you're not like, oh, I'm good at sales and you just stop educating yourself. Like you should always be sharpening your ax, even more so when you're niching down and like learning about the problems that are going on in that industry. Talking with people without trying to sell them as just like a connection call and actually yeah. genuinely understanding their business. And like continually becoming an expert. You don't just become an expert through reps, you become an expert through combining reps yeah. with actual research and knowledge. And like you said, and like if someone's yeah. not a fit, let them off the hook. Like you don't have to sell every single person. The more that you say that you don't want to work with that person, it inherently makes them want to work with you more because you, you're not begging for the sale. And they're like, why does this guy not want my business? Like what is, what is, like, what is going on here, right? Like what am I doing wrong as the prospect? Um, yeah. And like that's a perfect point of like you can't just go into something and thinking that it works because it works for others. Like you said, you had that a buddy of yours who made that big commission check, and you're you didn't you didn't think like oh he's he's better than me or he was born into this or whatever. Like you were like, I'm gonna problem solve and understand what is he doing that I'm not doing. Yeah. Figure that out and then execute and iterate upon that process. Yeah, like like it, it was pretty much like, especially that was that like he's still one of my best friends like of like almost 15 years now, but like. We, we literally like, he, he showed me that I was like, yeah, like what? Like I was like, where, and that was before I got the job. I was like, where do I sign? Right. And so you have to really approach it as like, everyone is inherently the same, right? We all have the same human problem. There's two types of problems in life. There's human, I think I heard Casey Neistat say this years and years and years ago. We have yeah. two types of problems. We have human problems, life problems, and money problems. Money problems, money fixes money problems, right? Your girlfriend breaks up with you. Money is probably not going to fix that problem. Right, no. or you're sad, or you're, 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 one of your parents dies, or your grandfather dies, or your brother dies, or something like that. Money is not going to fix that problem. That's a life problem. So, realistically, like in or for the the money side of things, the only reason why people are doing better than you is because they know something that you don't. Right. I think that's 100%. a hundred percent. Who said that? I think Tate said that. But he's absolutely right. And the reason why you know those guys like us who are me and you are like grandfathers in the game now, right? Like we're we're all <laughs> bro. But the reason why there's like 19, 20 year old kids with like agencies and different types of things that they're doing, 
who are just absolutely fucking crushing it is because they understand things that you don't. And that's why if you're new in business, the only thing that comes, the, the way you get there is just by consistently just working and becoming an expert and being educated, working with different types of people, doing different types of things, setting yourself apart and really becoming an expert in your industry and being educated on a multitude of different topics and multitude of different things. Like how are these changes? Exactly. Like things like how are these changes to this software affecting, you know, your client's business, like different things. And so that is really, really, really important. And I think truthfully, like you have to become an expert. Like if you, if you learn how to sell, right, you can very much, I think if you learn how to sell and you're like a salesperson, you can very much learn the service delivery or whatever, the, whatever the hell it is, right? You can learn the back end. You can learn how to do media buying. You can learn how to run ads. You can learn how to be a copywriter. But if you can sell and you can get money in the door, you're going to be very, very successful. Yeah, if you go the opposite way, that's where a lot of the problems happen, right? If you start off as a product guy and then you try to transition into sales, you have such yeah. bad habits. And like that's why a lot of like SaaS founders are the worst salespeople because they're too close to the product. They don't understand the, the value benefits of why people buy. They think yeah. of it in terms of like, this is a really kick-ass cool tool. And they don't understand why people aren't buying it because they're not speaking to the emotional human needs, right? Like the money problems or the personal problems, they're selling on features. Yeah. So I always, I always think it's like you said, it's easier to transition from sales to product rather than product to sales yeah. because you're looking at it through an incorrect lens of product first, not actual solution selling first. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you then, feel about um, like different types of, different types of sales processes? Like, cause I know you and I do our outbound a little bit differently. Right, but yeah. like different types of sales process. Like, do you think there's like a one size fits all sales approach that like people are, you know, because there's a lot of like different, you know, different ideas going on around around in the space. Like, do you think that there's like different? Um, do you think there's like a one size fits all approach? Like, like learn this method and you'll be good forever. Or no, I mean, I don't think there's a method, but I think there's just more of like a a mental framework that's going to make you successful in sales. And we've been talking about this whole call. It's just yeah. listening and asking good questions based off of the information and treating, like understanding the person at the human level and not just thinking, mm -hmm. how can I get this sale? But like, how can I actually help yeah. this person with a problem that they have? If you do that parlayed with any like methodology or script or guru, whatever, you should be all right. As long as you have those core yeah. principles of how you're going about selling. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. And like, I, think I know like we're, there's, yeah, like the, it's all about the fundamentals. Yeah. Yes. And never forget the fundamentals. Like even when you have success, like don't forget to stick to what got you to success. A lot of people always want to like complicate things. And like, if you saw success doing this simple framework, just continue to do it, like do it until it's dead. Right? Like a lot of people are always like, okay, I did this. Now I got to learn this new thing or complicate this process this way. Like if you're doing something successfully, there's a reason why it's successful and like don't forget the foundation and the fundamentals that got you to this success. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, but I know we were talking before we started recording about like sales management, right? And I know kind yeah. of we're both in that space. Um, you're looking to kind of get into that space. So um, what, do, what do you think is like the most important thing for anyone listening to this call It's like managing a sales team or has a sales team that needs a manager? Like what types of things are you looking for? Yeah. So in terms of like managing your people, it goes back to the same thing that we just talked about. You have to understand them. Yep. That's it. You have to understand them. What motivates them, right? So there's like this... And my friend Ricardo has managed, you know, you probably know him from Twitter, but uh, Ricardo has managed tons of salespeople, like door to door, like in person salespeople. And yeah. he, has this, he has this saying, he said, it's the motivation and management matrix. If you manage them too much, they hate you and they, they're filled with resentment. And if you motivate them too much, they think that you're their best friend. And so you have to have this constant kind of push pull on the spectrum right here. And I think you have to, and then also you have to genuinely understand, them. like you have to, and back, you know, when I used to work in a, in the corporate sales environment, we understood that people are motivated by two things, ego and shame, right? So the people who are doing well, you reward with ego and the people who are doing poorly, you shame. 
Now, I'm not saying, like, you know, dig into them and, like, talk bad <laughs> about their family, but, like, talk their performance, right? They're underperforming, yeah. so you have to figure out what – there's a reason why they're underperforming. Is it because they just suck and they don't have the right mentality or mindset because most of the game is mindset? Or is it because you failed as a manager to train the employees and actually give them the best tools necessary in order for them to be successful? So I remember – actually, I got blocked on Twitter by this kid who – was like, I don't know, it was like 20 years old talking about, oh, I run a sales management company, I'm, I, I place reps and all this, all this stuff. I think this, this is about last year, I think August of last year. Oh no, it might've been April of last year, I'm not sure. But pretty much he put out a tweet and he said, oh, my sales team is underperforming, so I had to get on the phone and show them, like, no, your sales, like, and, and show them how it's done. No, your sales team is underperforming because you didn't give them the right tools and training necessarily in order, in order for them to be successful. Yeah, direct reflection of you. That is a direct reflection, and then bragging about it on Twitter. And I said something, and then we got into a little bit of a spat, and then I called his girlfriend fat, and he blocked me. But that's another thing. If a guy is trying to teach sales and doesn't have a pretty girl around, he can't sell. Yeah. <laughs> I truthfully think that. But uh, I think in terms of like sales team management, so like you have to understand the psychological reasoning as to why people are the way they are. Then you also have to understand what their goals are. And so if you understand what the goals of the person, like me, like when I was 22, I literally just wanted to get paid. I just wanted to get paid. I want this thing. I want this apartment. I want this car. I want to be able to have a little bit of money in my bank. I want to be able to take my friends and my girl out to dinner. Like that's, and that's what I, and that's what I told my old manager. And you have to get a genuine understanding. And then you have to kind of future pace it, right? Like what happens after you achieve that, right? Are you still going to be motivated by money in the same way? Like, are you motivated by career growth? Are you motivated because this is going to be a great place for you to learn and really develop transferable skills and really, you know, kickstart your, your life, especially if you're hiring young guys. And also and a good thing, a good thing on that is like people that are motivated by money, the, the money is a motivation for something else. Mm -hmm. Like what is that mo money being used for personally, ego wise? Yeah. Right, like, is yep. it is it status? Is it being able to buy your mom nice stuff? Like, yep. money does a lot of different things. And like, if you again dig in to their actual personal need of like why they want to make cash, yep. then you could also help manage them in, the, in different aspects because yep. you know the root of the actual motivation. Hundred percent. Like, what are they? What do they want to do with it? Right. Yeah. What do they want to do with it? Like, or people that like want a career. Right? Like they want, you know, they want to maybe manage people. They want to learn. Like I was very much like, I wanted to get paid and I also wanted to learn. And so there's two types. And, and so what's interesting is about is, is with salespeople, right? Because right now, especially in the space, we have a lot of these people who are like gurus selling like the Amazon offer, the Walmart, like all that automation, the, all the whole like scam offer and stuff. But you have these kids who are learning to become salespeople but they will always forever be subpar salespeople. And the reason is, is because they're in the wrong organization, which is going to develop bad habits or they're, they're in a non-systemized organization. There's two types of sales organizations that I feel like young people should join, right? So you need from the management perspective, either an already ironclad established process, right? Something like I was in or something like you were in, right? The enterprise sales, you know, financial sales, business to business sales, where the company's doing hundreds of millions of dollars a year, the systems and the processes are refined. Number two is a startup. So a lot of these little companies online are startups, but you have to pick the right one. And you have to pick one where you are going to receive deep levels of training. There's a couple things, deep levels of training, you're going to be able to work directly with the guy who owns and runs the company, right? Where you're gonna be able to learn those processes. Like if, you, if I hire a 19 year old kid who has no experience in sales, right? And I'm, you know, let's say I'm starting a new company, I hire a 19 year old kid to do sales, he has no sales experience. What I have to provide him is I have to provide him all of my knowledge, right? I need to replicate myself. And so you have to, you're, you're literally forced as a founder, as, a, as an entrepreneur to give them the resources that they need to be successful because it's a direct reflection of you and your company versus yep. these guys that get these salespeople from who, who knows where and they're selling like these shit offers and they really don't care or they have like kids, like 17 year old kids on Instagram reaching out and trying to set meetings. That is like, and, and so what you see is those kids that try to go set meetings and become SDRs, what happens is they become so jaded, they never get the training, right? They never get the training. They yeah. never get the support. 
and they become so jaded to business, they become jaded to sales, and sales was a beautiful opportunity for me and you, because we understood and we did a lot of things with, throughout our career so far. But they we were managed never- correctly. Like you said, yes. you had a mentor, I had a mentor, and like yes. it shaped the way yes. in which I went about the rest of my life. And like, like a lot of these kids just don't have it, right? It's a churn and burn situation. They'll hire yep. 15 commission only people, and eight of them will work out, seven of them won't, and they know that, and they don't really care, and it's yep. a numbers game. But like, what's gonna get a company from like, you know, hundreds of thousands a month to millions of dollars a month is your ability to find, cultivate, and grow humans, capital within your company. Absolutely. And like, Absolutely. if you don't have that like mentality, like early on, like you're already setting yourself up to fail. And a yep. lot of people like, like a lot of founders, and the hardest thing I think in sales is to teach sales. Like doing sales is easy. But yeah. teaching another person how to be successful at sales is the hardest thing, like skill set wise for me was like transferring the knowledge in a way which is easily digestible to someone who's never been there. Um, yeah. yeah, and I know we're we're coming up here. I got a hard stop coming up, but um, no closing remarks from you, anyone listening to this call looking to get into sales, who's a sale, in sales already, like what do you want to leave them with? Don't listen to everything you see on the internet. Number one. Number two, learn from the right people. Learn from people who genuinely have verifiable experience. Learn from people who actually know what they're talking about, right? And if you're a sales manager with a sales organization or you're looking to hire salespeople, make sure you run them through personality tests. And you have to get a fundamental understanding of who the person is and what makes them tick. The next point is if you're someone who's, you know, let's say a founder, you're trying to sell two people or sell two prospects, understand the prospect, understand their situation, and then create an offer that makes sense. Don't just say whatever the hell you want to say in order to try to get a deal across the board, because that's not only going to hurt you and your reputation, but it's also going to hurt your company and it's going to be a giant headache. But yeah, that's it. Yeah. And I'll piggyback off of that is like when you're looking and finding reputable sales trainers, make sure that they've had success in multiple different industries, selling a multitude of different types of products. Like, don't just go to the sales trainer who's only had success selling this one thing because they're not going to know the full holistic view of sales and selling to a different type of avatar. They can't truly teach you sales. They can teach you how to sell one thing. But when yep. you're looking to get trained in sales, you want someone who's more worldly in the world of sales. They've sold financial services and B2B and B2C and info products and all this stuff. Like, they're going to be able to give you a much wider range of knowledge and training just because of their life experiences. That's the yeah. one thing that I would look for. If you're looking to hire or looking to buy mentorship, making sure that that person knows what to do over a course of multiple industries. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, it's an interesting space right now. Um, you know, maybe one day I'm gonna start my business as a high ticket coach for coaches, coaches and coaches selling high ticket coaching. But until then, I'm gonna keep actually doing <laughs> doing real life stuff like you want to you want to look at people and you want to learn from people who have had success in multiple different things like for me like I could have said you know I can say like yeah like I, I've sold loans and then I started my own business afterwards but I had so much experience in so many different industries and also multiple eight figures in, in revenue generation to where the point to where I've have experience in every industry and then I went on to sell my own stuff and then I went on to sell my own info products and there's so much different experience as well and so you want to learn from people who have experience and you want to learn from people who have prior success in different industries. The issue, there, and, and this is you know, for all the listeners, I think right now, especially online, there's a lot of people who have only ever had success in anything selling their own thing. Not doing, you know, the, the only success, the only business success they have is selling their own product, right? Which, all power to them. They can do whatever they want. But when it comes, to actually learning from someone. Like maybe that guy was making 150 grand a year, or like in my case, I was making 150 grand a year. But the thing is, is I have so much more experience, which now allows me to wait, make way, way more than that. Or maybe you, when you were in corporate sales, you were making what, 200 grand, quarter million dollars, right? But you have all that years and years and years of experience. Yeah, you might make less money on the front end than the guy selling his own course or his own product. But on the back end, Obviously, like uh, you were you were talking about, like with the a deal you just did, it's like, how many of those deals are you going to do this year? They're huge, they're massive, right? And so yeah. you just start to, you start to scale past that really fast. And so, 
those are my those are my final remarks. Dylan, I appreciate you having me on. Of course, dude. That's yeah, great. It's always a pleasure talking to you. I'll uh, I'll link all your stuff in the bio below. So if you guys want to follow David, great follow, great content. Excited for appreciate what you got coming out, brother. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for cool. hopping on, dude. Yeah, no problem. Of course.